formation of the moon, or theory, theories for the formation of the moon, and then we're going to talk about tides, how the moon interacts with the Earth. So, first of all, formation of the moon. There's currently three theories, but really only one good one, and I'll explain why. Um, for the formation of the moon, we have to realize that the formation of the moon had to be pretty tricky because the moon, relative to size of the Earth, about one quarter of the diameter of the Earth, is pretty big relative to the size of the planet. We don't see that in any of the other planets. I mean, we see it in Pluto and Charon, but they're a very different system. Um, so, there are a couple things that we also have to keep in mind. Remember, the density of the moon is about three grams per cubic centimeter. It has a small iron nickel core, where the Earth is going to be, it's about five and a half grams per cubic centimeter, same as like Venus. And so there's a fairly difference, uh, big difference there in density. But the surface of the moon, the rocks that they bring back, are very similar to the surface of the rocks that are found on the surface of the Earth. So, one theory was what we call the capture theory. That the moon was formed just like the other planets, meaning that it was going around the sun, and the moon was formed somewhere else, and it got too close to the Earth, and it got captured by Earth's gravity and got pulled in. The challenge with this is because the moon is so big compared to the Earth, it'd be very, very hard for Earth's gravity to capture it. Most of the time what would happen if the moon was coming by us, something large like that, all we would do is deflect its orbit because we wouldn't have a strong enough gravitational pull to put it into orbit around the Earth. And so that would be a challenge. Uh, it could be true that if he did, if he did capture it, it would have had to be in an orbit very close to being almost similar to the Earth's because then it would be going nearly the same speed and then it might be possible, but if it's that close in orbit, then eventually they would usually merge and they just become one bigger planet. So not as likely a scenario. Computer simulations can't really make this one work, even in the early solar system. The other one was what we call the accretion theory. Which is how planets form. Accretion means you take smaller things and you make bigger ones because they come together. So what if Earth started out as a very tiny chunk of rock with the moon going around? So they were both very tiny, only a few hundred miles across or something like that. And then all this other debris comes in and hits it, and they both get bigger. And so over time they grow together. So essentially they formed as a, a planet-moon system as small chunks of rocks already orbit each other. Um, if that was the case, since they're grabbing all the same amount of material, then the moon's density should be much closer to the Earth's density, because it got the same amount of iron and nickel and all that, but we see this significant difference between them. So we don't think the accretion theory is as likely. So the third one, which is the what we think is the most likely one, we now call the impact theory, which says that here's the sun early on in the formation of the solar system, Earth was going around the sun, and it got hit by something fairly large, back when there was lots of bombardment going away. All right, that large impactor actually got destroyed and got absorbed by the Earth, but it threw chunks of material up into orbit around the Earth. That material in orbit then coalesced together and became the moon. Now, the reason we believe this one is more likely than the other ones is we can actually make this occur using computer simulations. If you have a large enough body hitting the Earth at the right angle at the right time, then you can actually create a body that's about 1% the mass of the Earth in an orbit about Earth's size. Also, it matches the idea that the density would be less. Because here's the Earth. Earth has already had the iron and nickel starting to gravitate towards the center because it's heavier. It's still a molten sphere. When this object comes in, it's going to break away most of the stuff from the outer part, which means it would have a less iron and nickel in it, which is why it has a smaller iron and nickel core than the Earth does, a lower density. So currently, this is what we think is the most likely theory for the formation of the moon, but the truth is we don't know for sure.
but that seems to be the one that uh, fits the data the best. All right, let's talk about tides. Tides occur because here's the Earth. Let me put the moon over here. Remember, not drawn to scale. But tides occur because the on the Earth, different parts of the Earth feel different poles from the moon. So you can imagine if you're up here, you feel a pole from the moon at an angle like that. Down here, you feel a pole from an angle like that. And here you feel a pull straight on. Well, that angle pull to the moon means that the water is going to try to move that way. And this water is going to try to move that way. And over here, the similar thing happens. And what happens is you end up with a bulge of water, not drawn to scale, on the side of the earth facing the moon and the side away from the moon. Essentially, it stretches the earth out into a flat thing. Well, the earth doesn't move very much. The land doesn't, but the water does, so we have this significant change. So on this side over here, you have high tides. And this side over here, you also have high tides. Or here and here, you have low tides. And so, every day you have two high tides and two low tides by the time the Earth rotates around for 24 hours. Now they realize that the tides actually vary by about 48 minutes a day because the moon is moving in its orbit and it changes its position, essentially it rises 48 minutes later every day, so that makes the tides change every day too. And that's how they knew it was linked to the moon because of that change in when the moon rise corresponded to when the tides occur. Now the sun can cause tides as well. But the sun is much further away, and so it doesn't have as much differential pull. It's the angle that you get, the difference between it, because the moon's closer, even though the moon's gravity isn't nearly as strong as the sun's, it has a bigger effect on the tides. Okay? And so we can have special tides. So when we have the case where we have, these are called spring tides, occur when you have the earth here, you have the moon either here or here, and the sun here. So they're all lined up, and this would be when you have a full moon or a new moon. Then you get very high and very low tides, meaning there's more water pulled off in these bulges because the sun and moon are both doing the same thing to the earth. So spring tides are extra high and extra low. And that occurs near a full moon and a new moon. Typical tides on the Earth, if you go to a beach, are around three feet change, okay? But that can vary depending on where you are, the shape of the beach, the angle of the beach, all those kind of things, okay? Now we can have what they call neap tides. And that occurs when the Earth, Sun, and then the moon are at right angles, so the moon and the sun are actually kind of fighting each other. This is that first quarter, and this is that third quarter. And in this case, the moon's trying to pull all the water on the earth this way, the sun's trying to pull it this way, so you don't have as big a difference. So you have smaller high tides. and higher low tides. It's also because the moon is pulling on our tides that it's actually slowing down the earth. Our rotation of our earth is getting slower. So 24 hour days right now isn't the way it's always been. In fact, about three billion years ago, shortly after the earth was formed and solidified, a day was probably only on the order of about 14 hours instead of 24. But over those billions of years, the moon is actually getting further away and it's slowing down the earth. Essentially, it's stealing our angular momentum. And so we're slowing down. Now, it's a small effect. It's like a few seconds per million years. But when you start to talk about billions of years, you start to notice that effect.
you start to get thousands of seconds, and thousands of seconds are getting close to hours where it changes. So, here's a couple of pictures of some tides. Now, there are certain places, the t largest tides on the Earth occur in Canada, at a place called the Bay of Fundy. And as it warms up, it's got a special thing. Now the water, you know, moves the same everywhere on the Earth. So why would it be much bigger tides in one place than the other? Well, it has to do with, especially in the Bay of Fundy, the way the shape of the bay is. So the bay goes like this. It has a bay, and then goes out to the ocean, which is out here. And the water comes in like this. It comes over this ridge. So this acts like a basin here, kind of like a tub of water. And if you shake a tub of water back and forth, all the water will slosh to one side, and then it'll slosh all the way back to the other side. Well, what happens in the Bay of Fundy is this bay is big enough that the water sloshes to the side, and it goes back, and it does it at the same rate as the tides coming in and going out. So it's what we call resonance. It's always pushing at the right point. It's kind of like when you're pushing a kid on a swing set. If you always push them at the same time, they're going to keep going higher and higher and higher because you're pushing them at the same point to give them a little bit boost. Same thing here. It just gets it higher and higher as the water's sloshing back and forth in time with the tides. Most of them don't have that exact config geographic configuration to make that work. But you see, here's the difference between high tide and low tide. These tides can be 20 to 30 feet difference. So a huge difference here.